Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, Tulsa's source for great gardens. SouthwoodGardenCenter.com and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on The Best of Oklahoma Gardening, we'll be talking trees. We'll have trees to avoid, trees to consider, host Casey Hinches will propagate a tree, and we'll visit a woodland garden filled with large, beautiful trees. here today talking with Dr. Dwayne Elmore who's with the Natural Resources Ecology and Management Department here at OSU. He's an extension specialist and we want to talk today about the calorie pears. We all know they're a little bit invasive but there's other things that you might be seeing out in the wildlife. Dr. Elmore, so behind us is a, a calorie pear. Yes. Um, it is blooming, you can see, and it's starting to pass. Let's talk a little bit about the characteristics of calorie pear versus some of the others. Okay, so it's been planted uh, widely across the state in the eastern U.S. It has uh, really nice showy sp early spring blooms and uh, upright and rapid growth. And so it's a nice shade tree, but it has a lot of undesirable characteristics as people are, have found out. Um, it's really prone to, to break during ice and wind storms. It is a real problem in suburban and urban areas because of uh, grackles and starlings that like to roost in it. It's got a dense branch Very structure. Very dense, yeah. yeah. And then probably the most um, problematic feature is that it's invasive. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't stay put. It tends to move into open prairies and even into forests and completely change the plant composition. And it's becoming a huge problem in Oklahoma. Uh, it's already a major problem in Arkansas and Tennessee and parts east of here. So it's a plant we can do something about before it becomes more problematic. Because it's not just it's taken over fields, but it actually changes the ecology in those fields, right? Yeah, I mean, we talk, hear a lot about eastern red cedar, you know, invading prairies and turning them into woodlands. But the same thing's happening with Bradford pear, except this plant's not even native. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it... Whereas eastern red cedar, at least you can burn them or cut them, but this plant re-sprouts, so it's even more difficult to get rid of once it's established. And so that's something, one of the features you'll often see is these almost become thickets, large thickets of uh, calorie pear. Correct. So what are some of the other uh, white flowering spring trees that we might be seeing that aren't calorie pear? We yeah. want to define those. So a lot of the native plums bloom at the same time, and, and some of the more common ones that people will encounter are uh, sand plum, which tends to stay small and form thickets. Mm -hmm. um, American plum, which is a single stem and grows in forest edges or sometimes even in open forest. And then Mexican plum, which will grow in forest edges, but mostly out in the open. They all bloom at a similar time, but they're, they're easily uh, distinguishable. Uh, the, the sand plum tends to form thickets mm -hmm. and it has a coarse uh, leaf surface. Uh, all those plums have coarse leaf surfaces, so okay. that's one of the easiest ways to identify it. The Bradford or calorie pears have smooth, glossy leaves once they leaf out. And a very oval-shaped leaf, too. Yeah, and the, uh, the growth form is different. The Bradfords tend to form more of a, a conical or kind of pyramid shape once they get large, whereas the plums tend to sprawl and have a more uh, kind of, you know, outward growing uh, okay. shape. Okay. Yeah, I always think Bradfords look like lollipops and the, the Mexican plums tend to have more of a horizontal branching structure Correct. to them. And those are really desirable plants to have and good alternatives that are commercially available. Okay, and so the flower on Bradford's is always white, correct? Mm -hmm. Now on the plums, can that flower color vary a little bit? It can be more pinkish, but it, it from a distance it's probably going to look white. You mm -hmm. know, it, it would look quite similar. And I think that's one of the reasons that the calorie pears have kind of went unnoticed in a lot of places because pe people are used to seeing plums bloom in March. Right. And so they're just assuming, oh, those are all plums. But if you get 
a closer look, you realize, no, that, that doesn't belong here. Okay. And of course, we can always enjoy the sand plum jelly and, and that sort of stuff. And the Mexican plums as well? Yeah. The American plum, in my opinion, has the, the most palatable fruit. Okay. Uh, the sand plum would probably be second, and the Mexican plum can, tends to be a little drier. Okay. But it, it is... Uh, it is palatable. You can use it for jellies and jams. It's just not quite as as uh, as moist and sweet as some of the other plums. And could these work in a homeowner situation too, if they're looking to get rid of their Bradford pear? Or what are some other options that maybe homeowners should consider? Yeah, besides our native plums, uh, Red Bud is a good alternative. Of course, it looks completely different, but it also is an early spring bloomer. And there are white buds. So and if you're looking white. for the white flower of That's a Bradford. Correct. Yeah, and red it. buds grow fast, mm -hmm. whereas plums do not. Plums are slow growing, so if you want something that's like a calorie and that it grows very fast, a red bud would be a good choice. And they can tolerate full sun. They do best in partial sun. Uh, and another one is Carolina buckthorn, especially if you're in eastern Oklahoma. And it's a beautiful ornamental. It's a native plant, and it's also commercially available. All right. So just because we see a white tree out there blooming doesn't mean that it's a calorie pear. It could be one of our natives, but we got to be sure to distinguish before we take them down. Correct. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Dr. Elmore. Thank you. This is one tree that might not get much attention until it starts blooming in late spring, but when it does start flowering, everyone's going to ask what it is. This is the Chinese fringe tree, or Chiananthus vertensis. You can see how it got its name by these lovely white flowers that are all over the tree. And they are slightly aromatic and they have really long petals that when they start falling from the tree, they kind of create a snow-like effect. Now, this is the Asian variety, and so it's native to China, Korea, and Japan. There is also a North American native called Chianensis virginicus, and both are very similar, though. They are pretty small trees, only getting to be about 10 to 20 feet tall. Now, both trees are typically dioecious, which means they bear male and female flowers on separate trees. The Chinese fringe tree does bloom about two to three weeks earlier than our native. Both flowers are showy, but it's said that the male flowers might be a little bit more showy. But of course, with the female flowers, you get some fruit. It's an olive-like fruit that'll start to appear late in the fall if those female flowers are pollinated. Also in the fall, you'll notice that the foliage will turn to a nice yellow color. And then of course in the winter, we'll start to really notice this beautiful tan exfoliating bark. Now both fringe trees appreciate a moist, fertile soil, which might not be ideal for all landscapes. But I have to say that while it might be in a kind of a low area where it gets some runoff here at the Arboretum, it has done fine without any supplemental water for several years now. Without any serious pest or disease problems, you might consider adding a little fringe to the edge of your landscape. While many people think a willow is just a pond weed, I like the more romantic image of a graceful tree draped over the pond's edge. A lot of people think of weeping willows as probably the most familiar willow, um, but there's also the globe willow, which looks like a weeping willow, although it is a different species. Um, it looks kind of like a weeping willow in the fact that it's been trimmed up and has more of a globe shape to its form. There's also the corkscrew willow, which has contorted branches, which gives you a little interest throughout the winter time when it loses its leaves. The corkscrew willow is also popular to use in flower arrangements as the branches give some added interest. Now, if a willow tree is a little bit too big for your landscape, you might consider the dapple willow, which can be a large shrub. 
It is a hardy shrub here in Oklahoma from zones four to nine. Like the other willows, it does like wet conditions. However, it's better known for its foliage as it has variegated white and green foliage with just whispers of pink on the tips of it. Dappled willows can get quite large as a shrub, but you can maintain a smaller size by trimming them back. Willows have been used throughout the ages in ethnobotany. They were often used by apothecaries because the bark of the willow actually contains components, compounds that are similar to aspirin. They've also been used, their long branches have been used for weaving, both baskets and wattle fences. Now you might know if you've ever tried to create a wattle fence, when you put a live willow branch in the ground, sometimes it does root. Which kind of led us to a little experiment that we wanted to do. We were trying to root some willow ourselves and we left some in a glass water jar. Now this was exposed to all the sunlight. Of course willows like water so we thought this would be a good way to root them. This jar, we left them in water, but we put a bag over them to exclude the light. And you can see the difference in the amount of roots that we got on the two. This is both the curly willow and the dappled willow. Both seem to do better when we excluded the light. Cuttings are an asexual way of propagating a new plant. So if you've ever taken a cutting from a willow tree and put it in the ground to make a wattle fence, you may have unintentionally propagated that willow. Now the best time to take cuttings of willows is late fall and early spring. If you are like me and you like the romantic image of a willow tree, or perhaps want to make a wattle fence, go help your neighbor trim their willow. We're just outside of Fort Gibson at the Hidden Lake property of Greenleaf Nursery and joining us today is Mark Andrews and Mark is a grower here at Greenleaf and Mark you've got a couple of trees you're growing behind us uh, can you tell us a little bit about the difference between a sycamore and a London plane tree okay with sycamore and London plane tree there's several differences between them one of the easiest ways to tell them apart is the leaves mm -hmm. in that a sycamore has a leaf and doesn't have a lot of indentations on the lobes and this is a London plane tree here so you can see that it's got a deeper yeah. cut in there between the lobes on the leaves so this is one of the differences between them and then the other difference is with a sycamore it produces a seed ball but it produces a single seed ball on a stalk and on London plane tree they're produced in pairs mm -hmm. All right, and so now these aren't just any sycamore and regular London plane tree either. They're right. actually particular selections that you guys found around right. Oklahoma here. Can you tell us a right. little bit about them? One of the owners of Greenleaf, the principal owner, John Nickel, found these trees up in Tulsa. And uh, the Silverwood sycamore, he found, it's actually uh, around on Utica Avenue. Uh -huh. And the reason why we selected it is because it has solid white bark all the way down to the ground. Whereas most sycamores, you'll see that white bark, but then as the wood ages, it'll start going brown and the bark will turn brown. This maintains that white bark all the way down to the trunk, even on a mature tree. Wow. And uh, with London plane tree, you'll get some of that white bark, but it's nowhere near as showy. And so the Rockford Road London plane tree shows that same white bark characteristic and uh, all the way down to the ground again. And uh, so it's rather unique for a London plane tree. And these were selected from trees planted in front of the Philbrook Museum on Rockford Road in Tulsa. Well, how about that? And that's, I mean, both trees are really good trees and they're also showy. Um, right. The nice thing about having that white bark is it gives you some winter interest too. Right, exactly. And so that's really the main reason why we selected it. They're both will end up being big trees. Uh, the sycamore is definitely larger than a London plane tree. Mm -hmm. But uh, both do well, you know, here in Oklahoma. 
and uh, give you that interest all season long as far as having that white bark. And they'll give you a lot of shade on a hot day. That's they? right. They we need these bigger. to get a little bigger. Yes. <laughs> a little bigger. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing uh, these trees with us and differentiating this too. Okay, you're welcome. gets started with so many different species in it. Joining us today is Mark Bays, who is our urban and community forester for the state of Oklahoma, or one of the foresters, of I should say. Mark, can you tell us a little bit about how forests get started? Yeah, we can go back tens of thousands of years when the ice sheet was all the way down into Nebraska. And as that evolving climate shifted, you know, so does the species that are adapting naturally to those changing, evolving climate issues. We used to have white spruce actually that was native in Atoka County here wow. but so that's changed through time mm -hmm. so it's the process of changing climate and then you know the plants and animals actually naturally change as well the birds you know they they, they eat all these wonderful things right. and then they just go out and do what birds do right and, and put a nice pile of fertilizer fertilizer with it and everything <laughs> and, and so yeah so it's it's really climate soil types then natural events like wildfires the cross timber forest that we're in today it's evolved with a series of wildfires and naturally set fires for tens of thousands of years. All right, so what's an example? We've, we're standing next to a, a kind of a mess of trees, I would say, but you got excited when you saw this. This, this is an amazing example of just, you know, a, a, a little micro forest, a naturally occurring forest. Uh -huh. There's seven species of trees, native trees here, and, this and there's actually one invasive non-native just growing this close together just in this you know 15 by 15 plot it's yeah. just really truly amazing to see nature at work here right so so that you said there was one non-native now i know a lot of people are not fans of mulberries there's eastern red cedar in there uh we've got some soap berry in there too Got, we have elm in there, red we have bud. red bud, we have sugar berry. <laughs> yeah, uh, so, and but so the, the, the bad one of all of those is? Privet. Privet. Privet, yeah, okay. that's the one non-native that we see that is actually encroaching uh, in forest cover type just all across the state. It, it's really a problem for the state. And this is the landscape privet that homeowners use, but out in the wild it kind of takes off. Yes, because even those wonderful little berries that you have that privet is sometimes planted for, you have variegated privet and all different mm -hmm. kinds of privets, but the birds will eat those and then they'll go out, do what they do, deposit those with uh -huh. a little bit of fertilizer, and then another bush comes up more berries like that and so we're seeing this widespread not only in central Oklahoma but in the eastern part of the state where we have a lot of forest production going on so so that's the one invasive right. tree or the bush that I see. they're all they're all native here okay so. okay so how did all these get established so closely together I mean we know plants need space and yeah. trees need space to grow because of the birds this is a poop forest, <laughs> is what we'll call it. This is a poop forest. And so I think the eastern red cedar, just by the size of it, was most likely here first. Okay. And so then birds eat the mulberries, they come out and sit in the cedar tree, they do what they do. You know, then, then the privet, same thing. Uh, soap berries, birds love soap berries. Yeah. So all those other trees came secondary and it's like a little poop fest here. Okay, so before we know it, we have about eight different species right in the small area. More birds come in here, take those seeds and carry them off. And we've got our forest. That's it. That's right. That's fantastic. It well, is. thanks for sharing this yeah. and giving us a, a viewpoint from a forester as to how a forest starts growing. This is a, this is a beautiful example of, of a very unique poop forest cover type that we have in Oklahoma.
greetings. We're here at uh, Remote Claremore, USA, um, with Carolyn Peterson. Uh, we're here to kind of discuss and show you guys some different uh, elements and challenges that go along with shade gardening. So I'm going to take it off with her. It's nice to have you here, Carolyn. And thank you. Thank you for letting us come into your uh, it's, property and with show With the rain we've had this year, it was a lot easier than normal That's to right. keep things looking nice. It has been. So since we are back here and, and it's, you know, fairly private and, uh, uh, but it's also shady, can you tell us some of the challenges you do have with shade gardening? Well, of course, I don't have the blooms that you see in the, in the sunny garden. Mm -hmm. So I, I get um, perennials. So they bloom like the columbine blooms early and it's now gone. And um, the hostas do bloom because it's a shade plant. Right. But, um, so there's unique plants, of course, that have to go with shade gardening. Right, right. Yeah. Right. And then I do have problems. My oak leaf hydrangea was attacked by a deer uh -oh. or a few earlier. So it is coming out, but um, I usually keep a fence around it, but I thought it had gone past the fence stage. So I took the fence off and then they came, snuck in one night. And... Right. Daring deer, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think they like our pasture in the back. Oh yeah. The deer are getting more and more domesticated. They are, they are. And uh, we have quite a few. Right, right. Well, let's see what else is up this way. It looks like you've got something neat that is great for a shade garden over here. The Lenten Rose yes. does really well and it starts blooming in February. And you can see some of the blooms are still on there. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got two, three different colors here right. that do well. Yeah, they take uh, about 80% shade, don't they? Yes, they yeah. do, yeah. That's they're a great plant too because they're green all the time and they bloom in February when you just need a ray of sunshine. Oh, that yes, they do. Well, I really like this um, covering you have. It's just some pea gravel that you found? and Yeah, we buy it and then, okay. then bring it in, yeah. And you have to pick up the twigs and the leaves and right. the, the, the big branches that fall mm -hmm. every now and okay. then. But it's pretty well maintenance free once you get it down. That's great, yeah. I could see where, uh, I mean, it just defines the bed so well right, to have right, something right. like this. Yeah, yeah. I and like I, to come out in the morning with my cup of coffee and check all the flowers. Exactly, cool. And the grandkids like to come and walk through too. They're getting oh, yeah. interested in flowers, so they... Uh, yeah, kids would love going around yeah. those paths. Yes. <laughs> Maybe at a little faster pace right, than right, you want. Right, but... yeah. And then we're coming to kind of a feature here. Tell us about this uh, waterfall and kind of water course. Well, I was trying to camouflage the freeway that's behind us, so okay. I thought the water feature would give us a little bit of a noise factor, and it was hard to work with this uh, little hill here, so we came up with this design to um, the water recirculates. Right. Uh, and it, it gives us just a, an added attraction for this area. No, I mean, you made really good use of the lay of the land and how it conforms to that. You right. Know, it, it, it almost looks natural to me, you know, that it just Well, that's kind of what we were hoping, yeah. so thank you very much for that. <laughs> We put it on a timer so we don't run it during the night right. just to cut back on mm -hmm. the electricity and the use of the pump. The sure, right. And then the rocks that you put in, are they native? Are they found around here or did you? We had somebody come in and they brought a lot of the rocks and then we used a few that are uh, native. All of these right. paths are native. We put those in. Okay, yeah, because this is a... Kind of a rocky Actually, area. Actually, we found here. them on this place. Oh, right. Most of them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of sandstone in. When this. we were trying to dig a plant, we would have to wait and get the rock <laughs> out before we would put the plant in. Because we're at the beginning of the Taiwa Hills. Right. Yeah. Right, yeah. Right. So we really appreciate you being a host to having us come out and uh, look Thank at you. your garden, just some of the unique things about it. Thank you very much. Okay. Great.
There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week, we'll bring you some of our favorite segments on native plants and other tough plants to consider. And we'll have some tips on how to incorporate them into your landscape. We hope you join us then for more of the best of Oklahoma gardening and TV you'll grow to love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society.